Welcome to Cybe Stories, Renee. It's so great to have you with me today. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I appreciate you very much. Wonderful. Yeah. As we're getting started, Renee, I'd love for the listeners to know a little bit about who you are. Could you introduce yeah. yourself for us? Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, my name is Renee Leonard Kennedy, and I live in North Carolina. I've lived south, I think, all my life, and I have uh, was born and raised in Virginia, Tennessee, and I migrated to Tallahassee, Florida, then Miami, um, and then uh, came back to North Carolina, and that this is where I'm home at. Um, I, I work on my farm, and I also am an author of After the Flowers Die with In Game Press, and you can find it on Amazon. It was really great to follow that difficult book, uh, but it's, it's encouragement for life after loss, but to follow it up with sweet romances for every season. So I got to do short stories, two sweet romances. Uh, so I enjoy doing that. And I'm also the co-host of the Moral Tea podcast with Anna Gray Smith. And tell me a little bit about mm. that podcast. We like to get together and talk or interview people who are pushing back against the cultural norms. Um, and we like to talk about taboo subjects uh, that might not be talked about or don't get enough exposure. Um, and we dive deep into it. We, we like to think we do. We try not to be too shy about it, uh, the topics that we're talking about. So it, we have some interesting conversations with people. We've heard some really, really, really interesting interviews. Um, and then we also, uh, we the little side note is we film it in my farm, which is a log cabin. So we have a great time. We have a great time doing that. Yeah. So we hope it reaches multi-generationals because she's younger. She's in her 20s and I'm in my 60s. Okay. I'm 61. All right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That sounds very intriguing. Yeah. All of it. In, including yeah. farm. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. I thought that it would be a little slower at 61. It isn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that, right? Right. Life is just yeah. ramping up. Yeah. That paints a, a really wonderful picture of who you mm -hmm. are right now. Well, mm -hmm. let's let's get back into your life then. Let's start in your childhood. Right. Right. And to get an idea of how you grew up and how your beliefs developed towards God or not. Mm -hmm. Why don't you introduce us to your your where you were born and your your, mm -hmm. your your family of origin and what was that like in terms of church or religion or God or mm -hmm. was any of that in your life at all? I was born and raised in Bristol, Virginia, Tennessee um, to Frank and Jackie Leonard. My parents, um, they were regular churchgoers. Um, my, I really got my inspiration uh, to know about God from my grandmothers, my mamma and my nanny. Um, they were my directors in that regard. They, I would often find my mamma in her rocking chair whenever I went up there to see her later on, or even when, as a child, just reading her Bible. Um, and nanny and my nanny as well, she would sit on the front porch and just be out there, and she would just be looking in nature with a very pensive look, and I always thought, what are you thinking about? Um, but we did go to church um, as from early on, um, it was a great experience. I loved it. I couldn't, I wanted to go to Sunday school. I loved it so much. Um, and Mr. Bill Rollins, who's with the Lord now taught our class. And I just wanted to go so, so badly, but I wasn't regular because my poor sweet mom, she was so busy with raising four kids, but I, I delighted when we made Sunday school. And then I would sit in the church of my grandmother. She would be two rows up with her hat, with all the ladies in hats. Um, and I, I would say I, I love the Lord. I, I think I really, as a child, loved the Lord um, as a preteen. Yeah, I remember taking the walk down the aisle, my heart pumping. You know, I want to give my life to Christ. Um, and then the great, well, then some things happened, um, and it's why I wrote After the Flowers Die. I realized I, I, my favorite second cousin died mm. uh, around when I was 10, um, and he was 16, and he died in a car accident, and he was gone. And that, I think, was the pivot point where I began to think, oh, 
this is scary. I don't know what's going on, but is this wonderful God of the Bible that I've learned in Sunday school on occasions and, and even listening to the pastor? There's something very scary about him because he took my cousin. So I, I, a divide started to happen. Um, and it really kicked in when I, I hit my freshman year in high school. And I thought, I don't fit in. I'm just going to be me. Um, I, I was, I, I really do believe I had a very divided heart. I, there was a part of me that wanted to do, you know, follow God and do the right thing. So I, I worked at tennis. I worked at acting. I was maintaining my grades. But the other part said, no, I'm going to drink myself silly. Uh, because the darkness, the darkness was eating me up and I, I was, I had to do something. I, it had to go somewhere because I wasn't following the Lord. Um, so at 16, I remember um, shutting my little white confirmation Bible for the last time because I loved reading the Psalms, though I read other parts of the, I believe the New Testament and the old, I think I read everything I had. Um, but the Psalms particularly were my, my my go-to book. Um, and I have even said to the Lord, I can't wait to come to heaven and discover which page I shut that day, because I know it's going to speak to me even, you know, now. Um, and then I set out on a a mission of self-destruction, even though I still maintain grades. Um, but everything started to slip. Everything started to slip. Uh, the partying was extremely hard, um, you know, to blackouts, um, it was very, very dangerous. Um, and I continued this through college, um, about my second year of college, uh, a blessing happened to me and people don't see this and parents don't see this. Um, I got booted out of Florida state university because they had the audacity to kick me out because, you know, I wasn't attending classes imagine, and <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> so real consequences do something. Um, And all of a sudden, being told no um, made me step up to the plate. And I went in, and I I can't believe I had the boldness, but I went in and spoke with the dean. I said, I'm on the straight and narrow. I am am never going to do this again. I'm I'm ready to change. I'm ready to show you. And she says, I am so glad to hear that, Renee. I just think that's wonderful. I said, well, that means I can sign up for college, right? She goes, no. <laughs> and she says, what I want you to do is go to Tallahassee Community College. And, um, and you show me that you get your AA. And I don't want you pulling around. I don't want you bringing me C's and D's. Get me some A's and B's. Um, and come back when you get your associates. And I'll let you in. You know, we'll talk about it. We'll see. Because you, you will earn it. So that was an incredible time. Now, my drinking was still going. My atheism was definitely ramped up because at this time I met some, some people and this one young lady said, you know, if you don't remember where you were before you were born in that nebulous place of pregnancy, why do you think you will remember when you're, you're dead? So with one simple statement, I went, yes, that makes total sense. If I didn't remember what I was like, then why am I going to remember you know, it's just, it's just this world I'm in, you know, this is my life. It's from birth to death and it's all over. Mm. So I, I started, but, so I found a new passion in the sense of, okay, I've got to get these grades. I want to get into school. I will, I will show her. Um, and I, I found men and I got involved in a relationship and that was, a atheistic relationship as well. Um, so everything affirmed that part. Again, it was a divided heart. So I just want mm. to back up for just a minute. I know at mm. 16, you said you closed mm-hmm. your white little confirmation Bible for the mm. last time. And mm. you mentioned that you had a divided heart and you, you talk mm. about darkness. Um, mm. And I'm, and I know that you had to, the horrific loss of your cousin he was 16, mm-hmm. you were 10. And that, that mm-hmm. puts you on a little bit of precarious road of trying to understand who God was. There's a big leap between experiencing a loss 
and beginning to question God and then moving into darkness and calling yourself an atheist. I'm presuming Mm. that at 16, when you closed your Bible for the last time, is that when you actually dismissed God altogether? No, that is when I I said, and I remember distinctly, I can't believe, I, I can't tell you, remember many things, but I can tell you, I remember simply saying, this is too hard, God. I'm not going to do it your way anymore. I'm going to do it my way. And it was my way. Of, uh, I, I was going my way. And I laid the line down with them. So when you say you were yeah. going... I said goodbye. You, you were, yeah, so you, you were willing yeah. to say goodbye to God. It's, it's yeah. interesting to me because, especially considering Psalms was one of your favorite yeah. books in the Bible. And in the Psalms, mm-hmm. David cries out to God in all kind yes. of pain and loss. Yeah. Um, and so gave you actually an example of what it looks like to maintain a relationship mm-hmm. in the midst of not understanding, but still, right. you know, with God and God is with you, even though you may mm-hmm. not understand. But for you, I, I know you had that loss, but were there other things going mm-hmm. on that made you want to go your own way, as you say, and uh, move away from God rather than towards him? Well, I, I do believe, um, and you'll remember this from the time we were growing up, our culture was at odds. I mean, it's been at odds since the fall, but uh, particularly during our time, we had grown up in the late sixties. We knew that there was this whole back to 1950s and, you know, father knows best, but we're moving. uh, It was a lickety split pace to, you know, protest and, um, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade and all the culture was changing and, you know, women and Playboy came out, you know, as a child, my neighborhood, some kids had some really great, my, my sister had a great experience. I had the complete opposite. It was, it was a place of evil and darkness and heathenism. I mean, all there was, cause everybody was getting you know, their dads were getting Playboy in the mail. And so it was, you know, everybody was playing, you know, grown up at a very young age. So all this was going on and building up towards this obviously is the way to go. This other white, little white, white Bible, you know, even though David is crying out, you know, I, I'm thinking, well, I want to go down this road. Okay. And it was a very, very strong, I've always been very strong-willed, much to my parents' chagrin. Uh, so very much, it was a very strong-willed attitude, saying, okay, and I felt this kind of, it was heartbreaking in a way with the Lord, because it, it was saying, you know what, I'm just going to go this way because I'm going to see what it's like. You know, I wanted to taste the forbidden fruit. And I didn't want to lose any of it. I had seen, uh, I, I was into acting. I had seen, you know, the magazines. I was following the actors um, and what they were doing. And, and you know, just walking in the grocery stores at that time and reading the glamour magazines and the cosmopolitans. I was like, this, this is life. This is going to be much, this is going to be fun. This is, this other thing is too hard. Let's, let's just go this fun route. Not knowing... <laughs> what I know now that I just went the road of hell and it was, it was so hard. Um, and that's what led up to all that. I definitely yeah. remember what was happening during that time, the yeah. sexual revolution, the freedom, yes. you know, and like you say, the hedonism, I'm sure yeah. that the cultural pull, you know, your social groups, your friends, yeah. everybody, you know, the enticements, it was yeah. a lot. Uh, for yes. a lot of people around that time to, to try to see, they see something else, you know, and they want to try. Well, and I, I had, I had great, I always had great friends. Why they tolerated me, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it was the Lord's protection even then. I just don't know. Um, but I was still extremely wild. And I almost, I, I definitely prided myself in being that way. Um, so all I can talk to you about is it was, I was extremely divided and I, 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 the thing is, once you start tamping down that part, the, you know, the conscious, 
that says, you know, Renee, you shouldn't be doing this. This is not, not the right way. Um, that's, that's when the danger, you realize you've given yourself over to the world. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't even realize it. You, you just, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that slippery slope into hell. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. it's an easy path, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is path of least easy. resistance, let's just say. Yes. Uh, but, yeah. you know, and again, as you described your story, you mm. were moving definitely in that direction and it was, it was affecting your life and, and your, the yeah. way that you were not only, you know, treating yourself, but treating your obligations like school or whatnot. But, but through that, you also called yourself an atheist. Now, there's a difference mm -hmm. between kind of being a lapsed Christian, mm -hmm. if you will, and, mm -hmm. and just kind of going your own way. Mm -hmm. And and then rejecting God altogether, and I and right. identifying as an atheist. Right. What informed that, or or was that a conscious conscious thing that you were doing? It after that talk with the the young lady about that's when I all of a sudden I started forming my atheism. Um, and when I she said, "Well, if you don't believe it," I, and then I got to thinking, I, I started thinking deeper. But it haunted me at night because I, I knew death was real. And I, you know, so leading up to that point, I, I wouldn't label myself a Christian. I wouldn't label myself anything at that point, you know, uh, up to that I, I, when I was that age. Um, but the further I got, the more unrealistic God seemed mm -hmm. to me. I was a very lazy atheist. Um, and I, I basically, I, you know, it was, there was no room for God. He did not exist. Um, and I would, I would tell you firmly that I did not believe them in him because at 2 a.m. when you're still drinking, um, and you're lonely, you, you know, you, you think about, you ponder, uh, a nihilistic life and you go, okay, this is all there is. And it's haunting to you. And you try to work it out in your brain because that's all you have at that moment because you're not calling on a higher power, the Lord God Almighty. Um, so I would try to figure it out. And, and the only remedy for that was more drink, more whatever, to you know, more activity, more men to satisfy that. I made fun of Christians. I mocked them. Um I told my parents, you know, I mean, you know, I was just like I was always, hi, mom and dad, I don't believe in God anymore. I'm an atheist. Um, you know, what my true feelings at that point really were, I, I know I did not think about God. I did not consider him. I know the depths of my soul were crying out in lostness. Um, and I was so deep, I couldn't see anything. Mm. So, to, you know, to say that, there are some people who will go, well, I definitely thought this through, you know, in a sophisticated manner. I didn't do that. Um, I just know I was hurt. There was a lot of hurt behind that. It was very, I guess you would say, an emotional decision. But I was very, very cold-hearted about it. Did any of the, yeah. your, in your family or Christians in your life try to talk with you about God or your belief or any of that? Did you even entertain conversation in that regard? Or was it just something that was completely off the table? My brother, Roger, he's, he's my older brother, has always um, been deeply a, a deep Christian and wanted to read you know, and find and discover. And, and he still does to this day. Um, and he would try to talk to me. He would be the one the parents would send in to reason, <laughs> you know, my whole life. Because once you start living the life that I lived, it, it, it was just full of sin. I look back at it and I, I, you know, I'm the worst of all sinners. You know, it, it's, it was a very dark, dark life. Um, but he would come in and he would try to talk to me. Uh, there was a young man in college. I will never forget this. But it only added added to my, oh, that's why I hate Christians. Um, is He had invited me. Apparently, he liked me and invited me to play tennis. Um, and I loved beating up boys on tennis court. You know, I just loved winning. Um, now, I, you know, it, it was just fun. Um, so I gave him a really good battle. And I was winning. And he was he started throwing a temper tantrum 
I, I mean, I was just playing fair and square and quiet, just like I do, you know. Um, and but he started not temper tantrum, but he was just really mumbling to himself, and he was, you know, you could just his displeasure was rolling out of his body and onto the racket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, he's identified himself as a Christian to me. And he's like, if that's what a Christian looks like on the tennis court, I really don't want to have anything to do with them. Right. Um, and so at that point, um, I was, uh, I was really affirmed, but you reminded me of something that, um, I believe the Lord puts little plot points or people points in our lives to remind us of things. So when I was in my teen years, um, I watched a young man who was a freshman in high school, and he he was a Christian, and he proclaimed to be a Christian. And at this point, I was either, and I was either, I wasn't, I think I still was going to church, but um, his name was Tom Brown, um, and my my dear buddy loved just adored him, and she was my age, and they we would st- stand there and talk to him, and I would look at him, and I'm going, what is different about him? Because he was experiencing leukemia, so he ended up losing his leg, and he was the star football player and all that, and I remember standing there talking to him or not even talking, just listening. Uh, cause I'm going, Oh, um, but he lost his leg and I'm going, how can he be so happy? Why is he glowing? You know, I mean, he literally was glowing. How can he be? And he ended up dying. And I went to the funeral with her. Um, and it was, it was one of these points in my life. Now I didn't want to believe in God anymore. But it answered, I just was like, okay, if he believes this, then that really worked for him. But it was really one of these plot, these little people points that I came back to years later, you know, and I went, okay, yeah, there was the not so neat Christian guy playing tennis, but then there was this guy, this Tom Brown. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do think there's this going on in all of our lives. And I, I need to, rem- I actually say this to remind myself of all the loved ones I love who are not walking with the Lord, that God is in the business of putting people in their paths and giving them memories and touch points that are going to eventually lead them mm. closer. But I was, I was still out in left field at that point. Um, and I'd walked away um, and it, it was, I, I went through, you know, some really uh, a transition of men. Um, and then I get married and it wasn't until, I, I mean, I, it, it's astounding to me to think that during the birth of my son, I mean, during the whole pregnancy of my son, I didn't pray one time. I didn't think of God in my child's life. I didn't think about God and the creation of this beautiful child. Um, I didn't think of God at all. Mm. And it was when I was 29, when I had my son, I held him at a very difficult um, delivery and said, at one of the first thoughts, besides I'm glad he's in the world, um, is this is too big. This is something that is too big to simply have just happened. Mm. This couldn't just happen. That yeah, that that is a marker for many people when yeah. they see the what seems like a miracle of their child yeah. coming into the world. Now, let's back up for just a minute because we were talking about you were talking mm. about how you had kind of uh, failed college and you were encouraged mm-hmm. to go get your degree, your AA, and then come back. And so I presume you you had mentioned there that you were continuing to pursue atheism. You were dating someone who was an atheist. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right. And so Mm -hmm. I presume. This whole family. Is is from there to your marriage, was that the man that you married? You married someone of like-mindedness in terms of their beliefs? 
Well, he was my first husband. So I did marry of like beliefs, but that didn't really come up because you just don't think about it. You just, you know, I don't go. I now what was stunning about his family is one of the one of the family members was a Christian. So everybody would talk, oh, this is a Christian. And we'd all like, like, oh, oh, that's the Christian, you know, um, but that was it. You, you know, that never came up as a, a reason. I, I, I've really been passionate about a lot of things and dove forward into a lot of things. But a lot of things I just go along with willy nilly. And marriage is one of them. I was just, okay, yeah, why not? You know, um, so it wasn't our beliefs that aligned us at all. We just, we both, you know, loved reading and that we had similar interests in, in drinking. And, and I think I was just his great little buddy. That's really what I think I was. <laughs> So, so you weren't like a strong anti-theist, you know, it, it just, mm. it seems to me that at that point mm. in your life, you were just, it just wasn't part of your life. God, no, you know, wasn't. belief in God, non-belief in mm. God, worrying about it, talking mm -hmm. about it, nothing. Mm. It was just irrelevant. Is, is that? Yeah, everything. Yes. Yeah. But if you'd asked me, I would say I'm an atheist because I don't think of God. Mm. I didn't think about his presence. I just, he was non-existent to me. Right. Just a non-issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then that that the birth of your your child it did it cause yeah. you to think okay maybe there is something more maybe there is a god or maybe there's something other than I, that I should consider. It did. Um, it was just too special and too deep and you know, for somebody who likes to learn things too biologically incredible, you know, and I like, I can't believe I went a whole nine months without thinking of the bio biology, even though I read what, what to expect when you're expecting. I knew what size, you know, this little baby was. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's all I thought about was that, that part, you know, the, not even the science of it, just the book of it. <laughs> And, and so the moment I had him that was like, besides who's in the world is, this is too big. This is too big to have just happened by two people, you know, and it's too incredible. And that opened me up to start pondering about the Lord. Um, I had a lot on my hands as I was raising stepkids and uh, a new baby and helping with the business. And by this time I was with my second husband. I had done a lot of work and, you know, very few years with men. Um, but so I, I, my time was, I was exhausted. So I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the Lord. Um, but then a funny thing happened in that time period, um, my mother-in-law asked me to take my stepchildren to church because they were Bible-believing people. Um, and I wanted to be a good, you know, daughter-in-law. So I looked at her and I go, okay, you know, and I wasn't scared of the church in that sense because I'd been, I grew up, you know, so I, you know, I knew what I believed. I didn't believe in God. Um, and I thought, what's it going to hurt? You know, she asked me to do this for them. I'll do it. So we would, I found a church down in Miami and started taking them to it. Um, we would go. And your, your husband at that point was, what were his views? He, he said, he claimed to be a Christian, okay. but yeah, he was not, a, if he was a Christian, he was not a practicing Christian. Um, no, I, I, you know, the fruits were not there. Um, so he would, he would go to church with us sometimes. Sometimes he was, he worked a whole lot. Um, I guess that was his addiction. He worked a whole lot, um, even on Sundays. Um, but I would take the children cause I, you know, I talked to my mother-in-law regularly and I, you know, I could score brownie points. Uh, cause I had that people pleaser thing going on. Um, 
so I would listen, you know, half-heartedly. So I, I, I would just keep going and just kept going uh, and listening. Nothing changed at that point. I enjoyed the uh, baseball team or the softball team. Um, and then we um, moved up to North Carolina. And that's the Bible Belt. And I made jokes about that. I went, oh, we're going to the Bible Belt. Yay for us. Because um, Miami was a, I, I did love Miami. There was so many great things about it. Um, but except for the traffic. And the reason we moved is we, I did not, we did not want to raise our children in a car going back and forth to work. Um, so I came to North Carolina and got my my stepchildren in school and almost immediately uh one of my uh stepdaughter's friend's mother comes to the house and she she goes and she introduces herself and her name was Marlene Nance um and i was beginning to dabble in new age so i guess i was spiritually you know seeking mm. uh, just dabble uh, cuz something had come in the mail it was from some book club called One Spirit or something. Um, and I was like, hmm, you know, because I, I was like, okay, something weird was happening because I felt that same way with my daughter when she was born two years after my son. I was like, There's, this is too big. This is too big. So my friend came in and uh, I mean, she wasn't my friend at the time. And she, um, we're talking and I'm thinking, oh, great. That's nice. We're talking. Um, and And it felt weird because I wasn't used to just people walking in and sitting a spell, you know, as you do in the South and just taking it easy. I was like, okay, what do you want? And deep in my head, what do you want? Or what do you want from me? Right. Um, and she said, Hey, um, I have a really neat church. You want to come this Sunday? And I looked at her and I went, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. And she went, oh, okay. And she would stop by every now and then. She'd go, hey, you, did, you want to think it? You want to think about it? And I, 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 I don't know how many times I turned her down. Um, but one day she came in and she goes, hey, do you want to come to my church? And I'm like, okay, this woman is persistent in such a nice way. I hate to turn her down because we had started talking a little bit more and I was starting to get to know her and I really liked her. And I was like, okay, if this means something to her, you know, I'll go. And it, it felt very much like going to the doctor. I was like, okay, I'll come to your church. And, you know, she didn't bad eyes. She didn't jump up and down for joy and hit the ceiling. Like I think I would have, I would have finally, <laughs> you know, but she didn't do that. Yeah. She was real cool. And so she told me what time and, um, and then all of a sudden I'm going, Oh, I have to dress the kids up. I have to do this. And, um, so I end up going and it's a little country church in the uh, off road of Thomasville, North Carolina. And I drive up there and it looks like a little church. It's a little, it was a brick church with a white steeple and I'm going, Oh, what have I done? What have I done? But I, I really like this woman. I want to be her friend. Uh, it was nice not being lonely. Mm -hmm. It really was nice not being lonely. So I walked in with my kids and they were really young. Um, and someone, another friend of mine who is a dear friend of mine, said, well, we have a nursery. And I heard nursery. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this would be. <laughs> right, not so bad after yeah, all. <laughs> really, one hour of not um, having to, you know, watch my children, whom I dearly love. Of course. So I go in and I listen. And there's this man talking. And he is really intelligent. And his name is Joel Smith. And he starts he's starting this series and it's a, a series of apologetics and he is telling me answering all the questions that if I would have thought about it, I would have asked. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's talking and I am just fascinating because he's going everywhere from science to, you know, eyewitness accounts. I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking, I've never heard this before. This makes total sense. Um, 
but he got to creation and uh, you know no evolution and or something like that. I forget what it was something on creation and I, I go I don't I just don't really believe that and it was at the end of the day this was like the second day I'd come no it was the first day I came um, and I get at the end of it and I'm like that was really fascinating I don't I'm not sure I believe all of it um, so I go to him and I go I really don't. I, I get some of this. I don't believe most of it. Um, and I'm not really sure about it. And he just looks at me. He goes, okay. He says, hey, I'll see you next week. <laughs> and I didn't get a rise from it and I wasn't trying to. But I was like, wow, that's an interesting way to respond to somebody, you know. Um, so the curiosity was just killing me, you know. <laughs> I had to hear the rest of this. Um and I guess I started asking him a lot of questions. You know how when you're, you're really curious and all of a sudden the floodgates open, you go, okay, but what about this? 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 Um, and one day um, after a couple of weeks, he says, you know, I want you to go. I have some books for you. And he gave me Lee Strobel. Uh, he goes, here, let's do the case for Christ. So I read that from cover to cover and I went, Wow. Wow, there's something to this. You know, this is far stronger. This evidence is far stronger than my just eh, kind of attitude, my nonchalant, you know, blowing God off attitude. And then I remembered Tom Brown and I remembered the other Christians that were placed in my life. And I was like, wow, this is what they believed. Mm. Um, so it was really a magical time of exploration and the Lord was so good to give me this little country church. I mean, had it been a big one, I'd probably gotten lost in it. And so it was nice and small. Um, and I, it, and it's incredible because he loves apologetics. He was just so receptive. It wasn't, oh, don't ask me these questions. I don't know how to answer them or, you know, I, you know, feeling uptight about it. He loved answering these questions. Um, and not, and not that I, I inappropriately used his time, you know, but he, he started having classes and offering classes on apologetics and on other things. And what does it mean to be a member of the church? And what does it look like to be a Christian? And he was just a really fine teacher. So all of a sudden I started diving in. Gosh, I said, these are wonderful. I mean, yeah, I love the childcare, but it was like, no, this is really fascinating. So I started going down this wonderful, exploration um, of the Lord. And it, it was several more years before I gave the Lord my full attention. I, I said the sinner's prayer and I became a member, but even there's still, there was still a part of me that as I took membership into the church, after following and studying what it meant to be a real member of a church, you know, it wasn't just giving your money. It was, you know, giving of your time, but more than that, believing in the Lord God Almighty, you know, the Trinity and um, all the tenets um, that we follow. Um, but I remember thinking, just like I did in everything, with the exception, with exception of motherhood, um, is, oh, I can get out of this anytime I want. So that was kind of my attitude. Mm. I had I had grown it into my early 30s. That was my attitude. I can get out of whatever I want, you know, even though I had been proven wrong at FSU that you can't. Um, I still was um, striving. There's still that old man in me that needed to die. Um, so one day, um, the least likely of things happened. I went to the Denny's breakfast place to have breakfast and I see this coupon book and I think oh a coupon book I love coupons I love saving money at the grocery store um so I take it home and I happen to flip it open one night before I go to bed um and I'm looking through it and I'm like looking for the coupons and then it comes it comes on you know to a page where it says the sinner's prayer and I'm going, well, that's an odd thing to have in a coupon book. And then, but just like me, I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to read over each of these to make sure that I understand this, you know. Um, I want to, and it had little convenient little check boxes, which I love to do. I, I still to this day love to check boxes. <laughs> um, 
Um, so I read through it and the very last one was, um, just invite the Holy spirit into your life, you know, to rule, you know, to walk with you and guide you and lead you. Um, and I went, Oh, I didn't, I've never done that part. I, I said, okay, I'll do that part. And I checked. Um, and I'm not going to say it's a magic pill. You know what I'm saying? God, the way God works is the way God works. But when I prayed that prayer, um, I, all of that, um, things started happening in my life where it was unmistakable to me. The hand of God was moving like, cause I didn't have the power to do this. Um, one of the first prayers I asked was God make me a good steward. And now where does that come from? You know? Um, so I prayed that. I guess I heard it. He must have talked about being a steward and it's not just money. It's over our time, everything. So I prayed that and, you know, the Lord said, okay, Renee, you know, those books you're reading, I don't want you to read them anymore. They're really pornographic. Um, um, you know, the show you're watching, no, you can't watch it anymore. Um, and it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. That was the weirdest thing. Um, I wasn't resentful. I, it, it was a blessing. It was like, oh, finally, I have the power to get rid of this thing that I don't really want to do in the first place. And, and, and then eventually it came, um, and that's a fast forward after living, but it came to 2001 where I had prayed for two years as somebody who was really actively following the Lord. Um, but I was like, Lord, help me stop drinking because this is just dissipating the Holy Spirit in me. And I was a very functional alcoholic kind of person. I, I knew I had now, instead of doing the blackouts as a teenager and a young woman, I had said aside parts like where I would say, okay, I can do this. I can drink this much this night and this much that night. And it won't interfere with me raising my children, me going to the gym, me doing church work, me doing whatever. Um, so I, I prayed it for two years. And one morning I woke up and it was just, I mean, just like I'm seeing you, I, I, I and hearing you, it, it was like the Lord said, okay, you're done. You don't have to do this anymore. And I was like, thank you. Thank you. And I was done with it. It was October 14th, 2001. Amazing. Um, and it was like done, done. It's been done for a long time, but you weren't ready to catch up with it, you know? And that's how it's been. My walk has been, the Lord has been so gracious to just take me. It's, it's really a, a day by day. And now I'm learning hour by hour walk with him and lean on him. And I, it is, it hasn't, I've spent the hardest, um, you know, I can, uh, if I'm a crier, I could, I can, I could cry. It's been the hardest year since 2018 of my dad's death. Mm -hmm. And then my mom's, I mean, it's 2016 with my dad and then my mom. And then, um, a tree almost fell on me in 2019 and killed me. And then uh, 2020 happened and some things, um, in my, uh, my then marriage that were horrific. Um, and, but he's been there the whole time, even up to the point that I'm going to a, a mission trip in the Ukraine this Saturday with my daughter. Now I am getting emotional. How about that? <laughs> um, and I'm going and I, I kept saying to the Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to race through these days getting there and, you know, of tightness and worry. And I have, I've had worry, but I said, I said, I really want to lean on you. I really want to see the moments of you in there. And this is one of them. Um, and, and he, it was almost like you were leaning on me, sweetheart. You're leaning on me, not just to get through this trip and not just to do your five days of teaching. And then your two days of travel and your one day in Budapest you're leaning on me hour and by hour because I'm here with you. Mm. And, um, so that was sweetness, you know, so mm. to, to keep learning in the Lord is just such a blessing. And, you know, we think sometimes at 61, 
and as we get older, we can't learn or we get, you know, too hard headed, but he's teaching us all the time. So it's just in guiding us and loving on us. So it's a beautiful, it's been a beautiful walk, hard, but beautiful. Mm. So I, I, I tend to speed race through my life and then, but it, it's, it, it's gone from darkness to life. I love that verse. Mm. Bring us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And that is what he has done. Oh, that's, what he has done. That's amazing. You know, it, it yeah. is in a way a little ironic in that, I mean, what you're describing to me is that you pushed God away as irrelevant. You wanted nothing of him in mm -hmm. your life. But now you're sitting there speaking as someone who wants him in everything in your life. Yeah. <laughs> that you want to slow down enough to make sure that yeah. he is in your life, you know, and that you're not ignoring what he's teaching you or yeah. showing you or, or how he's with you. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what an amazing transformation. Um, yeah. You know, when I think about it too, I, I was just thinking about your story. Um, mm -hmm. I love the t the touch points that you say the the people mm -hmm. points the the way mm -hmm. the, the ways that he was drawing you to himself through you know even your your lovely little sweet neighbor persistent yet kind yeah, I know um, you know despite your refusals yeah. and then how uh, I mean for me surprising to find that the the Sunday that you go it's a pastor answering hard mm -hmm. questions. Yes. Uh, doing apologetics, which is yeah. hard to find in, yeah. you know, in large churches, much less yeah. small country churches, you know, yes. to find yes. someone who has a heart for that and understands that, that there are hard questions, but there are answers and yes. that there are, are ways and means of thinking about God and thinking about things of faith that are rational and reasonable and historical right. and Yes. And that that you don't have to dismiss your mind in order to believe. And yeah. I think that, you know, and it sparked a curiosity and a search for truth. Mm -hmm. And so that by the time you got to that little coupon book, yeah. you had enough answers intellectually that you were mm -hmm. willing to go there. And examples, I think, of of, yeah. of really beautiful Christians in your life. Um that, that that was something that you actually not only wanted or found attractive, mm -hmm. but also it, you you weren't just believing based on wishful thinking or attraction, mm -hmm. but it was something substantive and worthy of belief. Mm -hmm. um, so you got yes. to that place. And, and then it's amazing, too, how you invited the Holy Spirit in, and he has transformed your life. I mean, taken yes. away alcohol after years yeah. of being a functional al alcoholic that I mean yeah. that is testimony in and of itself yes. because God is obviously with us in the hard places yeah. what a beautiful story Renee well, thank you um, I'm thinking about those who might be listening who are far yeah. away they don't care they don't think they need God they've got other things yeah. they'd rather be doing um or maybe even those who, you know, are wondering, is there something mm. more than this nihilistic, mm. you know, existence? Is this all there is? I mean, mm. you have so many, you are in so many different places in your life. Yeah. And I think you can relate to those who, who don't believe in so many different ways. Mm. If someone is interested in, in actually trying to seek or find what you have found, the person of God in such an intimate way, what would you mm. recommend for them? How can they take a step forward? I would take a walk outside in a beautiful place and look around um, and study something you haven't seen and maybe ask for eyes that can see and ears that can hear. Um, and just for a moment, open your heart posture and just look at the beauty about you and wonder what if there is something deeper? What if there is something bigger? And then I would, if you're a reader, I would check out Lee Strobel's book, what, The Case for Christ. Um, J. Warner Wallace is awesome. Um, if you're in, into the CSI, you know, kind of 
things. He's, he's great to listen to as well. Um, there's so many people. Alex McFarlane is wonderful. He's a, he's a neighbor of mine in uh, Pleasant Garden. Um, there's so many people out there. Uh, if you're a book reader, or even if you're not a book reader, um, there's so many videos of people that you can just find little short spots on. Uh, just listen to that way. The podcast, I think, I mean, honestly, your podcast alone is witness. And I am talking to that person out there who um, heart, their heart might be beating a little fast right now. And they're thinking, hmm, you know, is this real? Is this true? Um, and I would, I would say don't run from the search. Run to seek. Um, because it's, you know, the worst thing that happens is you spend a little time investigating. Um, and that is on this side of the eternity. But what if it's true? Um, and what if your life can be enriched now, even during the dark times? So that is that is what I would do. And I would open the Psalms. I would read them cover to cover. And I would go, huh, why is that in there? And I would look at it. I would recommend highly a, a Bible app that I have used for years, and it's called eSword. They have a commentary, and they have C.H. Spurgeon, and he explains the Psalms. Um, and F.B. Meyer, he does as well, but you know, C.H. Spurgeon is really great to read because um, he explains the Psalms. Because some of them are, you know, you're like, okay, well, what do you mean by that, David? Um, and then there are other ones that are just sheer beautiful, you know, just... And I, and when you're ready, look at Psalm 51 and um, consider that. And that's what I would tell those who are seeking or maybe even considering seeking mm. is give it a try. Just give it a try. Be bold. Yeah, it is a yeah. step of boldness, I think, especially in yeah. this culture that's pushing back yeah. so um, fiercely. You know, yeah. it, it's okay to look. And to search and yeah. seek. Yeah. Uh, now, for those, you know, so many really wonderful touch points of Christians in your life, mm. whether it's your mother-in-law asking you to take mm. your, your, you know, her stepchild or your stepchildren, mm -hmm. or, or the neighbor who was bold mm -hmm. and persistent and yeah. kind, or, or even Tom, was it Tom Brown? Yes. Yeah, Tom Brown. What a beautiful example he mm. provided for you to give you a yeah. picture of what. Um, joy despite circumstance could look like for someone mm. who is in Christ. So how, how mm. would you commend Christians to engage with those who don't believe? You know, it, I look at that now um, because my sweet friend Marlene was um, persistent. And a lot of times I think we discourage that as Christians. We don't, you know, but don't nag, don't nag. I think there's a way to be persistent in a beautiful way. And I think the best thing that we can be is heartfelt um, and in relationship with them. And even if it's a short relationship, it could be the Uber driver, you know, that um, you just, you know, it's not, I, I don't want to say, you know, people say you never talk people into um Christ, you know, is the Holy Spirit's job. And, and there's, there's that. But I do think we talk about the Lord and what he's doing in our lives or what we, we pray for that person if we're close to them. So I do think we need to engage in somehow reaching out to people. And I think we need to pray for the opportunities. I think we need to, which I can be kind of lazy about at times because I'm like, okay, you know, some days I just don't want to be bothered with that. Come on. You know, I've got, I got my agenda to do. Um, but then also pray, you know, whether we're, we're in the, the Uber for some reason and you're like, wow, this is an opportunity. Okay, Lord, help. It doesn't have to be anything wrong. Um, but I do think we, we do need to have a sign of uh, somewhat persistence in it. And it kind of varies too. So you really need to I think we need to be willing to make mistakes, quite honestly, and I don't think we are. I think we're, we're looking to be perfect. You know, maybe now's not the time. I can't do this right now. I can't talk to someone about God right here. I can't mention my belief in God. 
I think we need to be bold and, and a little less worried of uh, what people think of us and a little less worried what we think about the way we do things. And, and you know what, it's going to feel like failure. I don't know about you, but I have tried to share my faith before with people and it has crashed and burned. It, it just, it, to me, it felt like a muddy mess, but I had prayed before it. I'd asked the Lord to help me. How do I know that that wasn't what that person needed? It was that muddy mess. You know, who am I to say? So um, I, I think that we just need to be a little more obedient in that. Um, and pe- that's a bad word now. You know, you can't say obedient, but uh, we need it. Um, so I think we need to just step up to the plate and not worry as much and just be us. Um does that make sense? Oh, it makes total sense. Total sense. Oh, what wise yeah. counsel, truly. Yeah. Renee, your your story yeah. and your wisdom um, yeah. are so rich and so yeah. deep and meaningful for, yeah. I'm sure, everyone who's listening. I, When I think of your story, too, I, I think of not only did God provide pointers in your life yeah. to him, But even though there were some places where you didn't want to see them or you didn't follow the direction of the pointer (laughs) to the source, um, there was a time in your life where you were willing to see the pointers for what they were. You were open enough to pursue. And look what you found. An amazing life, an amazing faith, a bold and courageous faith that you want others others to know. And, And I am so inspired by that and um Mm. and i think we can all learn from you to be Mm. open to wherever the the lord is teaching us is pushing us is Mm -hmm. you know wanting us to be bold to wanting us to learn Mm. to grow um to sit with him anyway but it it was because of your openness your willingness Mm. that you now find yourself where you are filled with Mm. the spirit of god no, so I, I love the Lord. Yeah, yeah, it's obvious. It's obvious. So, well, but it's obvious in you, and I just, I, I feel like we're having church right now. Our hearts, we, <laughs> yes, 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 and amen. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, thank you, yeah. thank you so much, Renee, for yeah. coming and and sharing yeah. this bit of yourself, um, so that others yeah. can find God the way that you have. Oh, well, thank you for what you do because you are a testimony. Thank you so much. You're so welcome.